welcome back to the channel. This is a little addendum to the last video I made, the SRAM Eagle new rear mech video that I made a couple of days ago. I still stand by most of my points in that video. I'll hold my hands up. I made one large error in one of my assumptions about how the mech is attached to the frame, is bolted to the frame, and that actually affects quite a lot of what I said. So I thought I'd make this little extra video just to say SRAM haven't asked me to make this. No one's asked me to make this. I have an engineering reputation. I'm really annoyed that I got something wrong and such was the kind of fever pitch of that release and you know I'm excited about bike parts. First of all in this kind of brief video we're going to address the thing I got wrong and discuss that in a little bit more detail and then I'm going to kind of go into a bit more detail about the other things which I still stand by which I highlighted in that video. I have a conscience, I don't like getting things wrong, I don't like throwing shade on things if I'm not right because it's not fair on anyone's business. And when you have, you know, a growing YouTube followership, you have great responsibility to, to get things right. And if you don't get them right, you have responsibility to correct them. And like I said, SRAM haven't asked me to do this. This is off my own back. I have my own engineering reputation to stand by, and I'm proud of that. So I'd like to correct things I got wrong and go into a few more engineering details using a few more technical drawings. Uh, just a brief summary of this kind of new mech. If you haven't seen the last video, um, this is the new SRAM mech on the left and the existing UDH type on the right hand side. I claim that, you know, these two being a unified body would have to have very tight clearance on the dropout to provide a decent clamping interface. Now, I also said that I was surprised that I thought one of them wasn't floating or a passive component and it turns out it actually is. So I got it wrong and I should have trusted myself in the first place, but only this inner plate of the mech is bolted to the dropout. So zooming in a bit more, we can see that only this inner plate of the rear mech, this left-hand plate, is bolted to the dropout, very much like a normal UDH type design or a normal mech hanger. And, and this right-hand plate is actually free-floating and almost passive. And so you might think, well, what's the point of having the right-hand plate if it doesn't add any reinforcement, if it's not touching the kind of clamped interface? What I think it's doing is there is a very small radial kind of clearance between what I call the dropout bolt, which is this item here, and this outer plate. So most of the time it doesn't do anything. Most of the time the load, the hanging weight of the mech is all going through this left hand plate. But I think this extra arm is used in an impact and then any small radial clearance around this bolt head on this shoulder here, it bears against the shoulder of that. And then that right hand plate comes into a bracing play. That's what it does. It braces in an impact, but I think most of the time it's actually quite passive. So what I mentioned before about the dropout width being really tightly controlled or it has to be very tight, tightly controlled in production in QC that's not really so important and that was wrong because these two plates don't get pinched in like a clevis clamp arrangement this right hand plate is actually free floating most of the time around this bolt. How many noobs out there I mean we've all been a cycling noob at one point I bet you we've all had that case of where you've dropped your bike at some point not really known about it like getting out the car leaning up against a tree or parking up at the cafe, it's fallen over. A Couple of days later, you shift into the largest cog at the back to go up a climb and bam, the mech's gone into the rear wheel. And that's because mech hangers traditionally are quite soft, they're quite floppy. That is a massive risk of having a, a soft floppy mech hanger. Uh, this should get around that. What shock loads it will put into the frame on a massive impact, I still stand by that. I've seen a lot of media outlets. Now to be fair to SRAM, I don't think SRAM have been saying this, but I've seen a lot of media outlets saying, Oh, now the, the through axle absorbs all the, the impact from a crash. Uh, the through axle is a metallic elastic component. It can't absorb any energy. Yes, it's now in the load path, directly coupled to the load path of the dropout and the mech itself, but it can't absorb any energy. It'll just pass it on to the other dropout and then up into the rear triangle and throughout the carbon. Um, it's a metallic component, through axle doesn't have any damping. It cannot absorb energy. So. Yeah, SRAM haven't been saying that, but a lot of media outlets have been saying that it's, that's a false claim. So they need to think about the physics of it before stating things like that, which kind of go against the laws of physics. Now, this is the existing or the, the old or the current, whatever you, whatever you like to call it, UDH mount. And it has a an allowance to swing backwards in the event of an impact. So if you take a frontal impact or something goes into the chain or something hits the cage from the front of the bike as you're traveling forwards, the mech can swing up and back. Uh, and that's about 60 degrees minimum as the SRAM tech doc stipulates. And the way they do it at the moment is they have this, this you know, physical abutment on the frame. So a nubbin on the frame, a little stopper here. You can see that's in the forward position. And then the mech can swing backwards and then it stops 
by this literal actual protrusion. Now that can be part of the aluminium forging, so dropouts in aluminium frames are normally forged, so that can be very, very strong, that can be a part of the forging. Or in carbon, it can be part of the carbon forging. Well, carbon's not actually forged, but it's compression molded. So if you do have a carbon dropout on your bike, more often than not, it's never hollow. It's compression molded in solid carbon. So it's very, very strong. So you can make this, this anti-rotation feature, whether it be like this, like this, you can make it very, very strong, very, very light and a unified part of the frame. And it's gonna take a fair whack to break that. Even if it does erode it a tiny bit in an impact, the rest of it will still be there. And the 60 degree thing is kind of like a ballpark figure. It doesn't actually matter if it's like 59 or 61 in terms of the rotation allowance. Now that's how they've done it in the current design. This is you know, actually from a SRAM tech doc. This is for frame builders. You can have it like this, you can have it like this, you can have a feature shape like that, or you can have actual a bolt inserted into the frame. I wouldn't do that because that's probably more likely to get damaged. But the part of the UDH mech hanger will swivel and this nose of the UDH mech hanger will stop on that abutment. And that's been, for the last couple of years, pretty well received. I don't think it's had any problems with it. This picture on the left, I'm not quite sure what frame, what frame this is, but this is a forged aluminium dropout. This, was where, this is where the weld would go. This is a 3D um, a CAD image, I think. That's where the weld would go on the forging. And that is the abutment that's very easy to put in in the forging. Very, very strong. I, I slated the serrated washer in the last video, and I still think it's a bad design, because unless I'm wrong, and hold my hands up if I am, I think they've got rid of this kind of nub in arrangement, physical stop arrangement on the anti-rotation feature. And the rotation is there to allow the mech to get pushed back in the event of an impact, which is good. But the way they've gone about this in the new one, I think is very, very risky. So I mentioned in this a lot in the last video, the component I really don't like is this serrated, knurled washer, whatever you want to call it. Now I think this is providing the anti-rotation stop now. So the way this works is this serrated washer is clamped with a knurled face against the carbon dropout, or it could be an aluminium dropout, which is not so bad, but in high-end bikes it's more often than not carbon nowadays. And it's clamped by the 35 newton meter tightening torque of this bolt. So it's held in position. And then we've done away with that kind of UDH part of the mech hanger hitting that little nub in, in the anti-rotation feature. Now what we've got is a part of the machining or part of the forging of the inner mech plate, so this part, we have this circular nub in here. Now that swings in this yellow arrow backwards and forwards to hit this end stop here, and I guess that's about 60 degrees, same as the old one. Probably is 60 degrees, I haven't measured it. Now that's fine. We've got rid of the physical nub in sticking out the frame. We replaced it with this knurled washer, but this knurled washer has to grip the frame. If you have, and I'll hold my hands up again if, if, if I'm wrong, if you have such a large impact that that knurled washer friction against the carbon dropout slips, it'll destroy the carbon dropout. Not destroy it, but it'll eat it away. And I have on good authority from another source on YouTube during their impact testing of the new transmission, they managed to slip that washer back in torsion. And they said it was like taking sandpaper to the dropout. It ate it away. Now I'm not gonna throw them under the bus. They didn't put that in their video, why not? I don't know why, um, but there we go. It can slip if you get an impact big enough. On the other type, on the old type, if you get a huge impact, yes, this is not very compliant and it could damage the carbon, probably not gonna drop, damage the aluminium forge dropout, but I think it's far nicer than having the serration hold the grip and set those physical end stops for the anti-rotation feature. So I still stand by that serrated washer thing as being a bit problematic and not very kind to the carbon frame if you get such a large impact from the front. So let's say a stick goes into the, the chain and pushes the lower cage back. If it goes in hard enough, it's, if it's big enough, it'll just turn this round. And the clamping load on this serrated face is set by the tightening torque of this bolt here. There are a couple of issues with that as we'll see when we talk about tolerance stack up, but it depends highly on this friction here, right? If this friction between the inner plate of the mech and the serrated washer changes, it'll slip back easier or harder, depending on if it's dry, if it's wet, if it's been cleaned, if it's got grit in it, if it's got a bit of grease on it from the through axle. This 35 newton meters uh, will dictate what friction you've got between the inner plate of the mech and that serrated washer and how much it can twist back. Another problem I see is if this gets dry, salty, dusty, is that if this set tuned friction between the inner plate of the mech and the serrated washer gets higher because of the mu or the friction coefficient goes up, if it starts to get a little bit of an aluminium corrosion in there, I guess this part is steel and this is anodized aluminium, if it starts to corrode and this these two faces lock up, 
then you won't get this sliding, this nice sliding between the inner plate of the mech and the serrated washer. Those two things will want to move together. Every time you push the mech back, they'll have seized. They could seize. We've seen it with aluminium corroding against steel. They could seize. The whole lot could slip back together. And every time you twist the mech back, you'll be rubbing away the, the carbon frame here. So I think that's not a, a foolproof design. If you keep the bike nice and clean, lubricated and as it should be, it'll be fine, but it's definitely not foolproof. Now I had a lot of hate in the last video about people saying, oh, it doesn't matter about the tolerances of the dropout because the mech is hung off the through axle. So the dropout can be out, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm presenting to you now my remake of the SRAM technical document. And clearly the tolerances of the dropout do matter because they've stipulated the bore for the bushing, the swiveling bushing of the mech as the datum, A. And then you've got a perpendicular tolerance of this dropout face here the 0.2, which isn't very tight, I'll give them that, it is quite loose, but we're making this in moulded carbon, don't forget, so you can't be very accurate. And then we've got a parallelism tolerance of the other face of the dropout, 0.2 to that. So this is all chained basically off this datum A, and then they create a datum off this face, which formulates datum B, outer face is then parallel to datum B. If the dropout tolerance wasn't that critical, why would they do this? And people this naive comment of people saying, I mean, to be fair, SRAM aren't saying this. Well, they kind of are. But a lot of media outlets, again, and commenters are saying this, that it doesn't matter about the tolerance dropout. In your last video, you mentioned that. Um, it just matters where the axle goes. Well, what does the axle thread into? The axle threads into the dropout. So, of course, the dropout becomes part of the datum system and part of the tolerance system. So this is why they've got tight tolerances. And a part of engineering is not just making things that look good and go together on the CAD screen or in the workshop. It's designed for manufacture. You have to kind of look at your lowest common denominator. What's your worst part of the manufacturing and supply chain? Now, when the bikes are, and I'm not knocking, you know, Far Eastern manufacturing. I use it myself in my day job. When you are pushing frames in factories for a couple of hundred dollars each, you are going to get some QC failures and you are going to get some dicey QC. So you have to design a product that's not just great for the consumer. You have to design a product that you know has great DFM properties, like design for manufacture. You make the manufacturing easier. Now, by chaining this all to the dropout, yeah, you are removing some tolerance stack up, which we'll see in a minute, but you're also requiring the QC of the dropout to be much, much higher because you can't then tune the mech alignment with the mech hanger afterwards. And it is a little bit naive to say everything is tolerance to the, the through axle because the through axle goes into the dropout. It threads into the dropout through the, the, you know, the dropout nut, which has got a thread inside that. This is not so much of a problem in an aluminium bike, aluminium rear triangle in a carbon dropout. Carbon epoxy is basically plastic. Every type of epoxy, well, most materials in the world actually, not just plastic, creep, viscoelastic creep, right? So when you talk this, this bolt in here, so when you talk this bolt up to, well, this is 25 actually, but I think this is an old one, this is a prototype. I think they've upped it now to 35 newton meters to get the friction between this plate and this plate correct. When you talk that up, you are giving a large axial load. I don't know how much, a couple of hundred kilos, maybe more. It's quite a big thread, probably, probably about 500 kilos. Axial force onto the serrated washer. Now that serrated washer is going to bite into the carbon and it's not just one, one thing. It's not a static problem. It's a time dependent problem because of something called viscoelastic creep. If that load is always coming in, that 500 kilo pinch load is always coming in, this serrated washer will move in over time. Not only does that make the tolerance of the position of the mech slightly different, but what it also does is it loses your friction, your set tuned friction that SRAM want in here. So let's say you've got, uh, you know, a, def a defined friction between these two plates, which you want for the, the mech knockback situation. If this serrated washer moves in, you've basically let off some of the preload of that bolted assembly and then your friction interface here goes down. So over time, let's say you tighten this up for the very first time on a fresh carbon dropout, if you came back to it three weeks later, your mech might be swiveling back with less force than it used to be because essentially your serrated washer has crept in a tiny, tiny amount. We're only talking microns here, but it only has to move microns because there's so little stretch in that bolt. A couple of microns moving in that serrated washer is going to change the preload on this bolt by huge percentage amounts uh, maybe up to like 50 percent of the bolt load you might get lost if this moves in by 50 microns something like that i haven't done the calc but that i think is another issue we didn't have with the udh one 
the, the QC and the tolerances to drop out, I think, are still quite critical. And this is backed up by SRAM zone tolerances, as you can see here. Uh, again, uh, quite a lot of media outlets are saying there's zero tolerance stack up for the new design. And again, if we're being you know really pedantic, that is completely not true. Let's have a look at the concentricity tolerances first of all. And to be fair, like to be fair to SRAM, these tolerances are applicable to all types of mechs, the existing mechs with, with hangers, but it's, it's a bit a little bit cheeky to say the zero tolerance stack up. So in concentricity tolerance, so in concentricity, we're going to talk about basically, crap drawing again, the up and down position of the mech relative to the cassette center line, right? That's more or less, we'll talk about the concentricity. You can call it radial, whatever you like. We've got the through axle clearance in the hub axle. So through axles are seldom like 12 mil, otherwise you wouldn't be able to assemble them. There's always assembly clearance in these things. They're 11.9. And SRAM actually stipulate that the through axles now need to be a tighter tolerance because they know they've said that you know everything is chained to the axle, so they've improved the axle tolerance to 11.96 minus 0.06 or something like that. So they've tightened that clearance tolerance up, which is good because I've seen some through axles like 11.5, like the Wild West ones you get off Taobao and AliExpress and Amazon, whatever. So there's, there's clearance there, concentricity. Yeah, it's tiny, but if we're being pedantic, through axle uh, to the dropout stub axle thread clearance. So I'm calling the stub axle, but now I'm calling it the dropout axle. There's the thread which locks into the inner plate of the derailleur, and there's the internal thread which receives the through axle. So there's two threads there. Threads always have radial clearances, so there's a clearance there. You've got the bushing OD clearance to the frame. So going back a few, this bushing will have a clearance, assembly clearance on the hole on the frame, and it also has a clearance on the OD of the dropout axle. And then finally, you've got the hub end cap clearance in the dropout. And now that's always the loosest one. When you drop your, your hub, your wheel into the bike, you need a bit of like slop in there to get it nicely into the dropouts. That's always going to be there. I'm not saying this is unique to this. Like I said, this is pretty much all of these are applicable to normal mech designs and dropout designs but it is cheeky to say it's zero tolerance stack up anyway translational this is where i think they've reduced the stack up quite quite a lot so translational i would say is just left and right they have reduced the tolerance stack up of that quite nicely um but again there's still the unknown of the serrated washer and this comes back to creep right anyway that's the end of the slideshow i hope you um enjoyed i don't know if you can enjoy such a weird presentation uh, i hope that's cleared up a few errors that i made in the last one and i still stand by i've not received any flack from sram i've received quite a lot of flack from commenters which is fine challenging is good and hold my hand up to when i get things wrong and i hope this has put it right i can't wait to get my hands on one of these that is the next step i've asked a few media outlets and they've actually got in contact with me if they can help me get some of these assets uh, to test properly because this is all speculation still until I've tested it. So hope you enjoyed that. See you in the next one.